At the 1972 Olympic Games, Lanny Basham failed in his attempt to win the gold medal in international rifle shooting. He had a mental failure resulting in his taking the silver medal instead. Frustrated, Lanny wanted to take a course in controlling the mind under pressure. After looking for such a seminar and not finding satisfaction, Basham began to interview Olympic gold medalists to discover what they were doing differently to win. What he discovered was game-changing. Basham created a system of mental control he called mental management. Within six years, Lanny Basham dominated his sport, winning 22 world individual team titles, setting four world records, and winning the coveted Olympic gold medal in Montreal, 1976. For the past four decades, Lanny has taught mental management to elite members of the sport and business communities. His clients include PGA Tour members, the FBI, U.S. Navy SEALs, Fortune 500 companies, Miss America finalists, Miss USA winners, and the Olympic teams of the United States, Great Britain, Canada, India, Japan, the Republic of China, Korea, Australia, and beyond. He is the author of several books, including With Winning in Mind, Freedom Flight, and Parenting Champions. I first heard about Lanny when someone recommended his book to me called With Winning in Mind. I was doing fitness training for some golfers at the time and found it really, really interesting. And I actually gave my copy away to somebody and never got it back. After a few years, when I got into bodybuilding, I reread the book looking for a competitive edge to help me in that sport. And at the end of the book, there's an invitation to reach out to the coaches and work with them on mental management. And I actually thought, oh my gosh, there's no way that this Olympic gold medalist is going to even talk to me. So when Lanny called me and left a message, I just was like shell-shocked and starstruck and was so excited. I began working actually with Lanny's daughter, Heather Sumlin, in learning how to apply mental management systems to my sport because Heather specializes in pageantry and sports with a, um, a panel of judges. So we felt like that was a really good fit at the time. I truly believe that using the mental management tools that I learned were the extra edge that I needed in order to achieve my IFBB pro card in 2022. I had the pleasure of training with Lanny in person in Texas in 2021 to become a certified mental management coach. And I am just thrilled to have Lanny on the show today. Lanny, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, I'm Happy super excited. <laughs> so. Lanny, can we start with your story about how you rose from an unlikely athlete as a child to becoming a master of your sport and ultimately an Olympic athlete and world champion? Because I love this story. Well, uh, I started out with a huge advantage. I was really a bad athlete. <laughs> uh, I, I was such a bad athlete. Uh, that uh, in sixth grade, we were studying Olympics in school, and the teacher made the statement in class, you know, it's possible somebody in this class could be an Olympic champion someday. I wonder if you have the best chance. And she was just trying to make conversation, you know, get us engaged. And this little boy sitting next to me jumps right up and says, teacher, I don't know who'd have the best chance, but I know for sure who'd have the worst chance, Lanny. <laughs> So that was kind of, uh, I had kind of had a well-deserved reputation for uh, uh, being the worst athlete. Uh, I, I, um, I played alternate right field in Little League Baseball. I mean, and this is, this is the lowest level of baseball you can possibly do. It. And right field is where you put your worst player. And I sat on the bench. I couldn't make that. I couldn't make that. that. So I was just not athletic. And uh, so this kind of made me upset at that I came home all fired up and uh, told my parents that um, I'm tired of being the guy nobody wants. And uh, so I, my dad, a uh, military officer, um, kind of a tough guy. He was uh, had got a battlefield commission in World War II, 
uh, he's a military officer. And uh, he said his advice to me was keep looking, you know, you're going to find something. And my mother, on the other hand, hauled me off the library and she made me pick out books on Olympic athletes. And, and uh, I think she just wanted me to read, but uh, I started reading and uh, uh, these people, every single one of them had huge obstacles in their way. I had that in common. I mean, Wilma Rudolph uh, has polio as a child. They told her she'd never walk. And Wilma Rudolph ends up uh, winning three gold medals in track. I mean, <laughs> so one of the things that I found that was in common with all these people is that uh, uh, they had to overcome obstacles, major obstacles to uh, to succeed. So I had that in common, and, you know. And so um, it wasn't long after that uh, somebody invited me to a rifle club meeting. And we didn't have any guns in the house, uh, so uh, we didn't hunt. Um, and my father knew about, you know, military shooting and things like that, but we didn't know anything about target shooting. And uh, so I, I, I asked the person, I said, well, tell me about rifle shooting. He said, well, it's an Olympic sport. And I said, are you sure? Because... And none of the books I was finding in the library had anything to do with the military, with uh, rifle shooters. And uh, he says, oh yeah, it's an Olympic sport. And um, I'm sure that it is. And I said, well, how tall do you have to be to be a rifle shooter? Because I'm really short. And he says, well, it doesn't matter how tall you are. And I said, well, how strong do you have to be? You know? I'm not very strong. And he said, uh, oh, yeah, it's a matter. The rifles aren't that heavy. I said, okay, how fast do you have to be? He said, why are you asking me these questions? I said, well, Sidious, Altius, Fortius, that's uh, the Olympic motto, stronger, higher, faster. So I figured all Olympic sports have to have to be stronger, higher, faster sports. And he says, well, rifle shooting is the only sport in the Olympics where we're trying to make the body stop. So I thought, well, I have trouble making it go. So I, maybe this is my thing. And so I go to the rifle club meeting and they let me shoot. And I wasn't, I wasn't great at it, but I was average at it. And I had never been average in anything. So uh, that's all I talked about all week was going back to that rifle club meeting. So my father takes me back the next week. We them at once a week. It's kind of an entry level program. And they cancel the program. So right off the bat, I have an obstacle <laughs> and I'm all, all upset. And I, I tell my father, I said, I, I think this is the most disappointed I've, I've been in my entire life. And he said, what are you, what are you disappointed about? I said, well, there, I'm not gonna get to shoot. And he says, no, son, they're not gonna get to shoot, but I'm your dad. I'm not going to say that you're not going to get to shoot so until we know for sure. So uh, a couple of days later, he picks me up from school and he'd got the keys to uh, a, a rifle range similar to what we were using uh, at uh, and that nobody was using. And uh, so he took me to that range and began to teach me how to shoot. The, the only obstacle, the only problem we had is that my father didn't really know much about target shooting. <laughs> so uh, he didn't let that stop him. And one thing I learned about my father is that if I don't know how to do something, I'm gonna learn, I'll go find somebody who does. And so he goes and he finds a, that there's a marksmanship unit at the base he was stationed at. So he goes to the marksmanship unit, finds out things about target shooting, comes back and, and teaches me. And um, 15 months later, I'm national junior service rifle champion in my country at a time when shooting was much more popular in school than it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in high school, every high school that had ROTC, uh, which was most high, of high schools had ROTC, most colleges had ROTC. 
And if they did, they had a rifle range and they had a, a shooting team. And so there were over a million shooter, high school shooters shooting rifles every day in high schools in America. And contrast that to, to today when uh, you're going to have to search long and wide uh, yeah. to find a school that has a, a rifle program. Uh, there are still some colleges that do, but uh, uh, there are not too many high schools have rifle programs. Now, uh, after school, uh, shotgun programs and things like that are, are, are growing, but rifle programs have, uh, it would surprise me if, if they're going from a million down to, it would surprise me if there's 2,500 junior rifle high school shooters in the country. Yeah. Shooting in high schools are kind of a touchy subject together anymore lately, sadly. Well, you know, there, there are some parts of the country where you, you go like this to somebody and you get expelled from school. Yeah, it's so, a totally crazy. You know, zero tolerance and all that kind of stuff. I, I know why they do it, but but it's, it's just uh, too bad because the feeder system uh, is, uh, is, was decimated uh, for, for my sport. But I, I came out of that situation. I have no problem. Uh, but the, the issue for me was that uh, I'm training on, the, on a range by myself. So my father, the only people on, on the range, for, for the first nine months, I'm by myself uh, on, on, the, on the range. My father and I are, are there. And that did a lot more for me than to me because I didn't have anybody else. There's a lot of drama with other people. I didn't have any of that. No, I didn't have anybody talking about their mistakes or, or complaining about how hard this was or anything. I, didn't, I wasn't trying to beat anybody. I wasn't too much worried about score. I was worried about getting better. And I learned how important it is to be self-reliant. And, uh, um, and I, I, I would have gone every day if my dad had uh, taken me, but he ended up taking me three, three times a week anyway. And uh, then my father spent so much time at the marksmanship unit that when the guy running that program rotated out, they needed somebody to take over that job and he was the appropriate rank. And uh, so they asked him if he wanted the job. So he took it. And the biggest advantage that my dad had and that I was able to use was my father was a solution-based coach. Meaning that he never told me one time that I was doing anything wrong. He just, when I shot a bad shot, he always said, uh, he said, you know, son, there's a one best way to do anything. We're going to find out everything we can about that one best way. And when you deviate from that, we're going to find out what you need to do. So his favorite words to me was, here's what you need to do, or here's what we need to do. And later on, he started saying, what do you think you should do? Which is kind of an important distinction, because now you're building self-reliance in a person if you, when you're asking them what they think they should do. And so... Uh, he spent some, he, he was such a good developer of people that his shooting team uh, far surpassed any of the bases that were, uh, that he was competing against with his team. And so he caught the, the eye of the United States Army Marksmanship Unit, which is the elite shooting unit and uh, uh, the United States. And uh, because at that time in history, the United States of America dominated Olympic rifle shooting. And all of our medalists were in the army stationed at the units that my dad was assigned to. So I went from not seeing any shooters to having access to the best in the world. And I took advantage of it. Um, I talked to these people, I watched them shoot, and they all had the same story. They all went to a college that had a shooting sports program. They all took ROTC. 
they uh, when they graduated, they all made All American in college. That's the top ten shooters or first team All American, and and uh, so that's what I did. I went to a school that had a shooting sports program. I picked my place to go to college based on the rifle team, not on a major or uh, anything like that. And I managed to secure a scholarship, not for shooting, but uh, an ROTC scholarship. Um, and um, I, uh, so my dad, that wasn't going to cost my dad anything to go for me to go to college, <laughs> which is he probably like that. And uh, I, uh, I went to I went to college to get out, so that I could go in the army to go to the army marksmanship unit. To, to, so I I knew that I wanted to be an Olympic gold medalist, uh, probably from the time I was twelve, mm. and uh, so uh, I uh, I get to the army marksmanship unit, and uh, I was a four year all American in college and. And uh, but I get there, and there's advantages and disadvantages to to entering the best team in the world. The uh, there's some obstacles in your way. The best shooters in the United States are all in one spot, and and they've got two teams. They've got the the Army Blue team, which is the top four shooters, and then everybody else. You know the development development team you know you call it varsity junior varsity a team b team however you want to look at it but the top four get to go to the really important tournaments and so uh i managed to get in the top four after working really hard and uh, i spent three years there but i don't remember winning anything and I would go to a tournament, and I'd shoot my highest score I'd ever shot. And my three teammates were gun gods. They were, they would have made, the three people on my team would have made anybody's list in the world for the top shooters and, and the top three shooters in the world. And uh, so I had to go around those guys. And I just, I just, wasn't able to do it. My practice scores were, were as good as theirs, their, as their practice scores, but my tournament scores were. And I would, I would shoot lower in a tournament than I was in practice. So I knew something was wrong, but I'd never thought that it could be a mental issue because in those days, we thought that the mental game was something you had. Mental toughness was something you had. I don't know how you got it, but you had it or you didn't have it, you know, it's, and uh, it wasn't something you could learn. So we weren't trying to learn it. And so there were no courses or classes or even conversations about it. Uh, there were occasionally a, um, you know, I asked questions to my coaches. I said, you know, what, why am I not winning? And, uh, they all said the same thing. They said, well, it's not your time yet. You know, it takes a long time to get to the top. So you need to, you need to just keep at it. You know, no, you don't have to do anything different. You said your time's coming. You know, these these maybe these guys will just get too old and you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, but nobody ever said you gotta change the way you think. And so uh, it wasn't until um, 1972, I've been on the team for three years and uh, managed to stay in the top four, but I'm, I'm a good team shooter. You know, I'm, I'm not winning anything. And uh, I managed to make the Olympic team in 1972 behind the best shooter in the world, my teammate, John, John Ryder, who was uh, the reigning world champion, held the world record. Uh, I'd never beaten him. He was in his prime. And, um, but I was training together with him. And when we got to Munich for the Olympics, 
Uh, Munich is kind of the epicenter of rifle shooting in the world. It, it's got the, the place, uh, this center of, of, there are more shooters in Switzerland than uh, and, and Germany and Austria and places that, that part of the world than any, any place else per capita in, in, in the world. Switzerland must have 400 Olympic rifle ranges in Switzerland. Interesting. And uh, I mean, it's a little bitty country, but everybody can shoot. That's why, you know, you can re you can remain neutral if everybody can shoot because uh, it's easier to bypass Switzerland than it is to invade it. So <laughs> I guess so. I, that's the way it is. So anyway, I get in the Olympics and uh, my my team, my practice scores were, were every bit as good as Jack Ryder, the best in the world. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of pressure on him. He might just pressure out in the Olympics. And so I thought, if he does, there's, there's really no pressure on me. Nobody even knows who I am. Uh, I'm going to be right there to catch that gold medal. And nobody will care that I haven't won anything in the previous three years. Because if, I've got, if I punch that ticket, you know, <laughs> you're it's in a on. You got it. You're, you're, you're straight to the top. And uh, so the competition starts and, and my teammate doesn't choke, but I do. And I just was shaking so bad that I, I just couldn't handle the pressure. And uh, after I'd lost so many points that I thought it was impossible to medal, uh, pressure's off and now I started to, uh, started to shoot really well. And uh, that's the reason why I got a silver medal is because that last half of the, uh, when pressure was off and I thought I had no chance and uh, a writer ends up winning the gold medal and sets a world record and everything and I go home understanding that I know I finally know what's wrong I don't have a medal game and I refuse to accept the fact that you can't learn this and so um, I I decided I I I I need I don't need to know how to shoot. I need to know how to win. So uh, how do you how do you do that? Well, I, I just followed what my father had always taught me. If you don't know how to do something, find somebody that does it well really well and find out what they're doing. Now in those days, we didn't have cell phones. We had answering machines. And so I knew a couple of Olympic gold medalists in other sports, and I knew world champions in other sports. And, and so I would call their, them on the phone, and they're never home, uh, so I'd leave a message on their answering machine. Uh, I'm Lanny Basham. You don't know me, but I want a silver medal in the Olympics, and you want a gold medal, and I need your help. Call me back. And they always did. And they were wonderful. They would tell me everything they knew about the metal game. And nobody had the whole story, but everybody had a piece of it. And so after about two years of doing this a couple nights a week, I, I, I saw patterns develop here and, and a system came out of this. And I upgraded to that system. And the first opportunity I had to see if it would work was the World Shooting Championships in 1974. And I came out of that with uh, three individual world titles, 15 medals total, uh, eight gold counting team events and, and four world records. And uh, we, didn't, we didn't rank shooters back then, we do now. But if we had ranked them, I would have come out of there number one in the world. And two years later, I make the Olympic team and uh, in 76 and and it's a different story. I'm, I'm a totally different person. I don't think that I'm really that much better technically, but mentally a lot better. And, uh, and I won the gold medal that, that year. And uh, then two years later, we have the world championships every four years, just like the Olympics. So there's a world title every, on the line every other year. So in 78, I won the world championships again. And so it, this wasn't just a fluke. Uh, and uh, so I, I pretty much dominated my sport for about six years. And then uh, after I won the Olympics in 76, I, I'd always kept this a secret. 
<laughs> not telling anybody. Oh, about. secrets revealed on my podcast. Yeah, you know, so, but but I decided, okay, uh, it's time for me to uh, to 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 go public with this, and and I wanted to know more about it, and uh, so I became interested in the mental game. And, and it turned into a business. And so 45 years later, uh, we're still teaching people that want to win and people that, uh, it's interesting to me that, uh, that if you ask any top performer in anything in the world, what percentage of what you do is mental, you're going to get a big number back. The number I get most often is my sport's 90% mental. And then you ask them a second question, well, since you've been doing it, what how much, what percentage of time and money have you spent on the middle game? And you get a low number. And like, I don't know. I read, I read a book. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think to your point, what you said earlier, that even back in, in the seventies, people didn't really believe that the mental game was that important. I think it rings true today that the majority of athletes and business people don't recognize the importance of the mental game. They, they, they're doing just like you, just like you experience good at the skills, good at the technical side, good at the execution, and then sometimes choking under the pressure and they don't even really realize it until they stumble upon mental game training, like mental management systems. Yeah. Everybody that comes through our courses all say the same thing. I wish I'd known this sooner. Well, yeah, well, when is sooner? Sooner is when you first start learning form. Yeah. You know, coaching really needs to, the, the middle game needs to start. Coaching the middle game needs to start when you start coaching form, the tech, what the body does. I mean, to, mm -hmm. to, to tell an athlete, here's what you need to do, but leave it up to them to, 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 to determine what to think about while they do it. Well, they have no training in that. Mm -hmm. And so they're probably, they're helpful and harmful thoughts. And, and I think that people do what I did. They have, I, I was just full of harmful thoughts. Yeah, you know? it, definitely. And it's so common. Like you talk about it in terms of, well, when I first found your book with winning in mind, I was coaching golfers and it's a perfect example that you talk about in your courses that when somebody, when golfers finish a golf game and they're sitting around the clubhouse talking about their game, it's a lot more common to hear people talking about what they did wrong. And same thing with when I was coaching dancers and same thing with a lot of athletes, when you ask them to how to go, they're going to tell you the negative part. And that is one of the really wonderful things I found about mental management systems is to especially teach people that what you think about, talk about, and write about matters, right? Yeah. And, and you know, everybody kind of knows that posit you need to be positive. I mean, because the top people are very positive people. They're not negative. And if you want to, if you if you want to be negative and think you're going to get away with it, uh, well, you just have to eliminate cross out success. Okay, <laughs> no. If you can, you're you're going to run away, run off everybody that uh, gets tired of hearing you complain, and uh, so nobody's going to want to work with you. Nobody was going to want to compete with you. Nobody's going to want to teach you, marry you, or any other thing if you constantly are. Uh, or, or not a positive person. What what they don't tell you is why positivity works. And the reason why positivity works is because of self-image. Self-image is your opinion of how you fit in the, to the world. Uh, your opinion, do I think I can do this or I don't think I can do this? If I don't think I can do this, even if I have the skills to do it, I can't do it. And mm -hmm. so this is, uh, so I kind of like the old Henry Ford uh, uh, quote that's so true. Uh, if you th whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. You know, so how you think does matter. But why is thinking positive better than thinking negative? It's because your self-image 
it grows or shrinks based on imprinting. And the imprinting is every time you think about something, your self-image grows that you want to do, your, 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 your self-image grows to whatever you feed it. And if you're feeding, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, your self-image grows. If you think, if you're feeding it, I can't do this, I can't do this, I just think. Every time you think about the solution, self-image grows. Every time you think about the problem, self-image shrinks. And people have developed a bad habit because they see other people doing it of talking about their mistakes. And if they understood imprinting, they wouldn't do that. It's, it's absolutely it's, uh, if, if you if you really wanted a, a clean house you wouldn't throw your trash on the floor but that's what you do when you are negative is you are putting harmful thoughts into your system that improve the probability that whatever you're putting in is you're going to get more of it. So every time, whatever you think a thing to be, that's what it becomes. So uh, mm -hmm. that's why positivity works. It's because of, of imprinting and self-image. And it well, applies as well to other people. I found that I feel my self-image growing when I speak positively about others, including my direct competition, because that's a common thing in the world is gossip and talking, talk, smack talking other people that happens, you know, even inside your own head. And it's the same. It's, it's creating negative energy and, and just causing your own self-image to shrink. So I find it really empowering to, encourage others and talk about the positive aspects of others and build them up because it builds me up. Well, that's right. Because did your mother ever tell you that if you don't have something positive to say about somebody, don't say anything at all. Did she say it? To, to oh you? yeah. Yeah. Well, I've asked that question a thousand times and everybody says the same thing. Their mother told them that too. There, I think people, mothers go to mother school and they, they learn these things, I, I guess, but <laughs> Uh, but it's 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 true. Well, why is it true? Because every time you say something about somebody else, a little bit of that comes back on you. So uh, when you complain about other people, you're improving the probability that you're going to going to do the exact same thing. As a matter of fact, it's it's really if you're attuned to this, you can see this all the time that somebody's complaining about somebody else doing the exact same thing you observe them doing. Yep. <laughs> it's just, Indeed. Uh, don't complain. Don't talk about what you don't like or don't want. Don't, don't, don't spend time criticizing others. Um, when, uh, when you're actually not help, you know, again, you're probably not doing anything if you talk bad about it, somebody else to, 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 to your 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 another competitor, um, you're 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 not affecting them at all, but you are affecting you. Mm -hmm. That's that's why, uh, you know, nobody really likes a, a a gossip and a complainer and. Uh, you're, 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 it's rare to see a complainer at the top. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's rare uh, to see that. Uh, most of the, uh, I have a term that I talk about elite performers. Uh, I think 95% of all winning is accomplished by 5% of the players. So those 5% uh, don't think the same way that everybody else does. And, um, and that that five percent, I know a lot of five percenters, guys that are that are on the short list of being the greatest of all time in in their sports, and uh, they're extremely positive people and optimistic. They all think that tomorrow is going to be better than today, and uh, they uh, they tend to uplift other people and they don't complain, and that's one of the reasons why they're so good. They just work and focus on the process. So switching a little bit to mental management and thank you for sharing your story because I could listen to it a thousand times. Um, what Can you explain what you mean by a mental program and why 
you teach it to your athletes and professionals? Sports sports have, are either proactive or reactive. The elements of a sport is are either proactive or reactive. Now the difference is that a, a proactive element is there's a repetition, there's a repeat. Like for example, some sports are 100% proactive. Like golf is 100% reactive. Archery, uh, shotgun shooting, things like that are one. The athlete initiates the action. And, and it's repetitive. They do the same thing over and over and over. And if you do it, it consistently, the, the, more, the, the more consistent you are, the better you score and the more you win. Okay, so that, that's like a, some sports are both proactive and reactive, like uh, basketball, free throw is a proactive element. Uh, a, but when the ball's in play, it's, it's, it's reactive. But uh, the shooting a free throw is proactive. Our serve in tennis is proactive, but when the ball's in a rally, that's reactive. So anything that is is um, made better by being consistent uh, is um, that's where the mental program comes in. If if, if there are helpful and harmful thoughts, and if you can determine the optimum things to think about before, during, and after a task and duplicate those consistently, you're gonna, you're gonna outscore somebody who's inconsistent. So we teach a system, which basically the definition of a system is the is that we define, help our clients define the optimum thing to think about before, during, and after a task. And uh, you might think, well, why is it important to think about something after a task? Well, what you think about after a task is hugely important about building self-image because how you evaluate what you've just done can either help you or harm you dep depending on how you what you choose to reinforce. If you if, if you make a mistake and you beat yourself up, your self-image takes a hit. When you make a mistake and instead you say, oh, what's the lesson here? Your 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 self-image has an opportunity to, to learn something from that mistake and and that's one of the major differences between the top five percenters and the people that don't ever get there. Mm -hmm. Is the top five percenters made uh, tons of mistakes on their on their way to the top, but they learn from all those mistakes instead of choosing to beat themselves up. Yeah, there's a big difference between that sucked and that needs work. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, that's one really great thing that I learned. I've learned so far through using and teaching mental management is that after the task, good. That was awesome. That was good. That was awesome and great. Or needs work rather than what most people fall into is like, ah, oh, that sucks so bad. And then you're hanging on to the the suck into the next task, and then it messes you up. Yeah, I think uh, far too many people, when they perform well, uh, to, to have have that's like, well, I'm supposed to do that. So, so I, I I don't ever reward myself or say that's like me or anything like that. It's just I don't reinforce the good stuff. I'm supposed to do that all the time, you know. Mm. And but but boy, if they make a mistake, I mean, they they that it, it's just. They're brutal on themselves. I think people are harder on themselves than they are on other people. Hmm. And, uh, that's that's a shame because uh, you're just you're you're, you're going to get what you reinforce. And so we teach people how to respond and not react to what happens, and that's a big deal. It is a big deal. And you teach to people beyond athletes this this system can work for business people as well right well, because actually, when when i first started this company 
I started out teaching Olympic athletes because that's that's the the guys I ran with, and that's a really poor business model because the Olympic and Olympians are broke. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna pay for anything good point <laughs> and they're kind of used to uh somebody else paying the bill you know mom and dad pay for it or a college pays for it or something you know association they get funding from the, the from the organization or something like that so the idea of, of of them parting with some their whatever it is uh to to buy a, a mental lesson is uh you know not 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 really that good but but i had to find a group that actually was used to paying for education and that's uh that's business people so for about 15 years i about the, all my clients were sales people were um business leaders leadership management uh, uh sales and they they would they would they would pay and so uh I, i've got a, a long long list and then and then uh i started this thing uh back before it was a thing so i mean i almost invented a profession here uh, because yeah there's I, a few others out there now but so yours is definitely I, the original but what i do is different than sports psychology because sports psychology is based on you get a degree in sports psychology, you go to a college and you listen to professors who probably have never won anything tell you how, how winners are supposed to think. I, actually, that's not really what you're learning in sports psychology. I've got clients that are sports psychologists and I've got clients that are in, in sports psychology PhD programs that tell me what is really going on in there. And, and there's a, a lot more classes on what not to think than what to think in, in in sports psychology sports psychology is based on psychology and i'm not saying that's it's bad I'm, I'm not against it at all i'm just telling you that it's not what i teach what i teach i teach what the winners are doing and i just talk to winners I, my education was in all of the people that i've talked to uh, and what doing what do you what are you thinking about? What works for you? And and seeing parallels that uh, uh, some things work for everybody. There are principles out there, and then there are preferences. There are certain div differences between sports and individuals, but uh, uh, but most people are not taught how to think. I mean, we 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 take a lot of training and 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 all the way through high school and college. I got a couple of degrees, and I I have never ever had a class on how to think. You would you yeah. would that that that's hard to imagine that, but uh, you know. Meanwhile, this thing up up that's above our neck is going all the time. There's so, so many thoughts. And that's one really beautiful thing about your system is it teaches people how to control their thoughts. And also going back to, you know, right when you were, when you were young and started out on your trajectory and your sport, everything that I'm hearing just sounds like a lot of relentless determination and focus and drive. Do you think that people are born with that? Or do you think that they can actually learn that if they learn to tra train the mental game, if they so desire, if they recognize that they don't have that kind of um, focus, that they can learn that. Well, I, I, I don't think passion, it's another word for drive, I guess. I don't think passion is something that you can demand of somebody uh, or uh, I don't know if you can teach passion or not. I, I, I believe I have to agree with that. There is a there is I think that people are passionate about things and passion passion comes and goes. It's like being in love. You know, you 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 especially unrequited love <laughs> where you're crazy about somebody and uh, they're they're not returning it. And uh, so now you're you're heartbroken and all that kind of stuff. But you that's all you think about. I mean, when you're passionate, that's all you think about. You wake up in the morning thinking about it, and you can be passionate about a problem. 
that's that's plaguing you, you know, or, you, or a hurt that somebody t offends you some way, and you get hurt, and you and you hang on to it, and you, and so it's it's an intense uh, feeling. And one thing that's interesting is to ask somebody that's really good at something, why are they doing that? You know, mm. what, because it takes. I, I read a book one time called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, and I'm endorsing that book a little bit. I don't get anything from Malcolm doesn't send me a check. It's a good book. But I thought it was a, was a more remarkable book. And he, he bases a lot of his work on what other people have done, which is fine. And uh, but one of the things he, he, he says, he's got a chapter in there called the 10,000 hour rule. It says uh, that was actually done research by the guy that wrote the book peak, but uh, that it was, he says that, that if you want to be, you want to be good at something, uh, spend 5,000 hours at it. But if you want to be great at, at something, it's going to take 10,000 hours. So, okay, well, nobody's going to do something for 10,000 hours unless they're passionate about it, especially if you <laughs> make no money at it. And that's yeah. like most Olympic athletes. They'll never make a buck. Uh, I, I competed at a time when we were all amateurs. So if you took one nickel because of how you, how you, you, you as a reward, you could, you could, I think I've got boxes full of medals in my closet, you know, but you can't spend the medals and then you would be rebuked if you would try to sell them, you know, and so. Well, he sold his gold medal, you know. What, <laughs> what a what a jerk, you know. And, and yet, the world looks at Olympic athletes as I mean, even I did. I I was I remember when you called me back the first time. I was like so starstruck that an Olympic athlete called me. But the world also doesn't realize that it's built on passion. It's not it's not a, actually a job. It's it's a job in itself. Well, you and just yet, pay for it. You get something else. Yes. Uh, so what? What? Why? Why do you do it? You don't do it for money. You don't do it for money. Uh, now there are a couple of sports where you probably do. Like, uh, if you get two hundred and seventy-five million dollars for being a quarterback on a pro football team, uh, I, I would say that's a good job. That Although, is a good job. I've seen. I see them get clobbered every Sunday, and I thought, boy, do they ever earn it? <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe not such a good job at times. <laughs> I'd, 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 I'd rather be, I'd rather be a, uh, I'd rather be James Patterson, you know, and write hit after hit after hit, you know, of, of, of best-selling mystery novels or something, and uh, so <laughs> nobody's hitting James. And well, only, speaking of books, you've got a few, you've got three books, don't you? Is it three or is it more well, than three? I've got a couple of books out there, but, uh, uh, and, and we, we've, we've been blessed, uh, the, with winning in mind tends, tends to continue to sell. And I, I, I am, am fortunate that, uh, that book is liked by everybody. And so like a lot of people. So I highly recommend it. For everyone listening that's a, a um but, uh, but but what happens is that you ask somebody why are they doing this and you're going to find out if they're if they're interested committed or passionate now people can be interested and they're they they don't really do a lot about about it if they're just interested in it but if they're committed to it they're they're probably competing in that in that that deal but the, the guys that are dominant are all passionate about what they do. And uh, so there are, those are the guys that are willing to do 10,000 hours. And uh, they're willing to do whatever it takes. Um, and uh, sometimes you lose balance in your life if you're passionate about something and you lose the focus on the things that are really important, like God, family, uh, relationships, and things like that. But uh, uh, but money can do that too. Can pull mm -hmm. you pull your way and uh, chasing chasing status. 
uh, I, 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 I've changed my what I'm passionate about a couple of times in my in my life. I mean, when I was first got into shooting, I was I, my my goal was to the reason I was passionate about it was I was it wasn't that I loved rifle shooting so much is that it was I just wanted something I was good at. I wanted to be respected by somebody instead of rebuked. You know, or we don't want you on my team, on our team. You know, I want I wanted I wanted to be uh, respected, and uh, and then when I got the Army Marksmanship Unit, it, it switched to uh, I'm, I'm, I want my share of the of the platform, the you know the top platform, the number one platform. Uh, I'd never been on it, and I wanted to get on it, and uh, I was I was desperate to have a world title. I wanted I wanted to be world champion for a while. And uh and then after that happened, it was uh it changed to uh to I want to teach. And uh both of the uh, the, the skill sets are different from performing to coaching or to teaching and coaching. And uh, I spent a long time at um public speaking and doing the circuits and the, the, the corporate events, keynotes at corporate events and things like that. And it's a good way to promote your book, but uh, it's, it's uh, you don't learn anything when you do that. <laughs> yeah. You learn when you teach, right? When you're instructing, you don't learn anything. When you're, really? coaching, when you're coaching and you do it right, and you're listening, your your clients will teach you a, a, a ton. Nice. And that's the reason why I tend to continue to, to personally coach people. Because um, I, I really enjoy, I enjoy somebody telling me that, that our information made a difference in their life more than winning a tournament ever did for me. Mm. Uh, winning, winning is, I'm not against it, don't get me wrong, but winning is very temporary. And, uh, you know, about 15 minutes of total bliss when you have won a, a tournament and everybody's, you're a rock star for about 15 minutes, but they don't give you any extra points the next tournament because you won last week. That's right. And it can also be kind of, um, a letdown after you win. I remember reading in one of your books where once you won the goal, once you won the Olympic title, there's kind of was a letdown. Oh, Can you I, talk I, about that? I was the most depressed I've ever been in my life it was the night that they put the gold medal around my neck during that day, the award ceremony. The night of the award ceremony, I was, I was, I was in a dark place. And uh, and it wasn't until my wife figured it out. She says, "You, you don't know who you are anymore. I mean, uh, you've always known when you when you reach one plateau, you've always known what the what the next mountain to climb was. There's always been a better thing. You know, if you're the best in the team, there's a, you're the best in the state. And if the best in the state, you're best in the nation. The best in the nation, the best in the world. And the Olympics is kind of a special a special place." And uh, but after after the Olympics, there's nothing, nothing bigger in my in my sport. That's it, that's it. It's like winning winning Wimbledon tennis or winning uh, Masters in golf. There's 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 no bigger tournament. Super Bowl. There's no bigger football tournament. You know, World Series. And it sounds like it's a common phenomenon when people win that big that there's that dark place of just not knowing what's next. There's a way to, to there's a way to uh, to not be the case, and you've got to always set a goal, and something else. You always set a goal before you reach this goal that you're working on. You always have a goal set uh, in, beyond it, and there are a lot of really worthy goals. To to, to I mean, the, the Olympic gold medal is not the only worthy goal out there you know and try something hard and that's really hard 
you know, people appreciate things in direct proportion to the price they pay for them. So uh, pick something that's hard, but you something you really respect somebody to be able to do and go for it. And, uh, you know, Olympic champions, uh, uh, you, if you're, if you know, some, some people just get, try to do it, try to do it again, you know, and, and that's, that's a good thing. You know, I'm not against repeating. Uh, it's hard to repeat. Yeah, that's hard to do. I mean, to try to win in the Masters twice, you know, that's not, not everybody does that. I, I, I have a client that, and a partner that I work with a lot that's won 40 world championships in ski and uh, in his lifetime. And nobody's seen me anywhere close to that. Uh, and uh, so it's it, but he he's uh but i think that it's special winning uh something that you've never done before uh so well and also the thing that i've learned about winning especially since learning about mental management utilizing mental management and becoming a coach in mental management is part of the winning process is who you become along the way and, and becoming someone who feels like a winner, thinks like a winner, acts like a winner. And even if the result is not the gold medal that you have become something more. And that's talked about in your son, Troy's book, attainment, that attainment of is different than achievement. It's, it's becoming more of a champion and believing that you are so, and that, that self-image becoming the self-image of a champion rather than just a trophy that ends up, you know, that again, like you said, Lanny, I can win a competition on Saturday, but by Monday, no one cares. Cause you know, you're just back on the same playing field. Yeah. The other thing that's, that's so often uh, missed by people that uh, don't compete or have never really competed at a high level is how much you gain with the, how much the people who come close to winning gain. You know, uh, to say that only one person wins in a tournament is like saying only, only the valedictorian gets an education. Mm. You know, the, the guy that, that went from fifth to second it, he wins too, or she wins too. The the person that uh, that couldn't make the cut makes the cut. You know that when you get better than you were yesterday, the uh, growth. And and when you ask these top performers, and I I ask them on this a question a lot is is when was it when was it the best? Nobody ever says when when they put the medal around their neck. Nobody ever says when the check shows up in the bank. Nobody, mm -hmm. nobody ever says that, or that 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 that's when it was won. They all tend to say something like, "It's the climb. It's get it's 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 overcoming, overcoming something that was a really hard for you that you knew you needed to do, but you you beat it." You you went over it. You went around it. You went through it. You crushed it. You grew because of that, and that, and you can use that growth multiple times in your life for other things. That's the reason why you 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 need to be careful about easy stuff. You need to be really careful about things that are given to you and without earning it. Because you don't, you're actually harmed by that. Uh, you, you, you need to earn it to mm -hmm. appreciate it. You'll never appreciate something that's given to you like you will, uh, like you, 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 you earn it. And I, I, I'm not talking about helping people who can't earn it. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm all for helping, helping people, but, but, uh, the entitlement mentality will suck you all of the all of the drive right out of a person. 
Oh yeah. I know. I know exactly what you mean in terms of in my bodybuilding career, the first show that I went to, I had this mentality. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I'm number one. I'm number one. And I came in last in four classes last. And at the time my coach said, that's the best thing that could ever happen to you. And I was like, what? But it really was because immediately I was someone who wanted to do, to do more, learn more. That's how I found really found mental management as I, I was looking for the edge, like, okay, I'm thinking about the wrong things because I was devastated and coming in last helped me want to work towards earning it. And so that's what I proceeded to do. And I've likewise seen, um, competitors. I, I have a competitor on my team right now, and she consistently won first place in every show she, she tr went in. And more recently, once she went into the pro leagues, she didn't place that well. And I was watching it and, and supporting her because I knew that it was going to mess with her mind to suddenly not place first. And lo and behold, it did because not that she was entitled, she earned everything that she had each time she placed first, but it's kind of a little bit hard to always place first and then suddenly not. Yeah. Well, that's, that's something that, that juniors face, you know, you, you, uh, um, one of the saddest things in the world is to uh, turn 21 in, uh, as, as an athlete, because, uh, a couple of things are going to happen to you right of the way, right away. One is you're no longer competing against teens. You're competing against all the adults too. And some of the mm. times are harder to, harder to beat. Uh, and then the second thing is that mom, there's, the day is coming where mom and dad's not going to pay the expenses. <laughs> and so now you've got to figure it out. You know, how are you going to, how are you going to fund these tournaments? How are you going to fund on this stuff and you actually have to earn a living at the same time and if you happen to be like most people is that you have other interests in your life and you 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 know you're trying to find a spouse and maybe you have a family and now uh, that, that, that's not that's gonna put a real uh a barrier to the amount of time and effort that you can spend on on your sport and uh, so I guess at, at every stage in a person's life, there are obstacles and opportunities. And you just have to see them for what they are and take advantage of the, uh, the opportunities and take advantage of the obstacles too. Because the obstacles, the, everything that you do in life, everything that you've ever done up to this point is preparation for what you're about to do. And so that's, uh, if if you have it have an easy ride, you're well you're not very well prepared for something hard. But if you've had a hard hard ride, but you've kept with it and you've worked really really hard, you can you can probably do it. If 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 you want to test your 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 metal, uh, master a musical instrument, mm. write a book that people buy. Uh, Learn a, learn another language. Um, those kind of things take diligence, um, and uh, you when you when you when you do that, uh, you'll find out about things. Things compete in something. I I think that one thing that I'm trying to get my parents and clients that I have to 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 focus on is. Help lead yourself, your children to something that they can do better than almost anyone they know. Uh, it might be, you know, playing drums in the band or their first chair, or violin or whatever it is, or, or they're, they're better at this sport than almost anybody they know or whatever it is, but but find something they can compete in where they can do well. They, they can, they can, but, but make it when, when they have to work hard, they grow in a way that uh, competition is a teacher. And uh, if it's done correctly, um, it has great 
dividends on anything else that a person uh, could do. Because I I would never have been able to uh, to start a company in an industry that didn't exist if I hadn't gone from nobody athlete to best in the world, if I hadn't have done that. Excellent. And, uh, and you got to marry the right person. <laughs> that too. And a beautiful, beautiful segue to close out, Lanny. Speaking of what parents can do to guide their children to to find greatness in whatever their particular um, passion leads them towards. Lanny has a book called Parenting Champions. It's an incredible book for parents and also coaches of young athletes that helps to be most effective for how you can help those athletes along. There's also another book that's most excellent. It's a short little read. I read at least once a year called Freedom Flight that Lanny has available. And of course, when it, with winning in mind. And Lanny, tell us as we close up, as we wrap up, where can people find these books and where can they find you and more information on mental management systems? Well, mentalmanagement.com is our our corporate store. Uh, the uh, uh, I'm in, in the process of building a new site, a new training site uh, that uh, will, will it, it, I may switch mentalmanagement.com to uh, the domain name over, over to that when I get it totally finished. But uh, uh, certainly you can contact me at, uh, at Lanny at mentalmanagement.com and uh, uh, love to hear from folks. Uh, the uh, Obviously, the books and everything are available at mentalmanagement.com, and they're also available, of course, in, at Audible and, and, uh, and, and Amazon. So uh, that's, that's uh, I would say, the place to start. If, if, if somebody really wants to read our books, I, there's a there's an order that you probably would get best you don't have to follow this i mean all the books stand on their own but i would read freedom flight first it's and so then, good then i would read with one in mind then i'd read attainment and then and then parenting champions but uh, so really quick question is freedom flight a true story uh everything everything in freedom flight happened Nice. That's exactly the way it happened. However, uh, I wrote that uh, well, quite a bit, quite a number of years after it this happened. So I had to I had to take literary license and and being able to uh, to recall the conversations. My my goal in the book is not to be absolutely factual in everything that it's it's not a documentary of what happened it, as much as it is i'm tried my best uh, efforts to get somebody to feel the way i felt when i met this guy and what absolutely a life-changing book it's a real hidden gem out there you guys my changed my life and I, I, I mean I think a lot of people are kind of in the same same shoes I was in I was going in the wrong direction and I had I just needed I just needed somebody to square me away like we used to say in the military yeah so, I'll, well, I'll just put it out there that Lanny said do freedom flight first and it's such a it's a short book but again I will say it's life-changing great message um and great way to take a look at all the things that you are probably blessed with that you can't even see. So thank you so much, Lanny, for giving me your time today. I really appreciate you and all that you do. I just am grateful for your time. Well, appreciate that. Take care. <laughs>